The Consumer Bankers Association is pleased to welcome you to today's webinar, What is Digital Identity and Why It Matters by Zenki. My name is Jordan and it is my pleasure to facilitate today's event. Thank you for joining. Please note we are recording and all participant lines are muted. If you have any trouble, please email conferences at consumerbankers.com or send a message in the Q&A box. This presentation will last up to 60 minutes and will include question and answer opportunities at the end. You may submit a question at any time by entering the questions into the Q&A box on the bottom of your screen. As a reminder, the views expressed in this webinar are those of the presenters and do not represent the views of CBA or its members. It is now my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Alexander Schlager, Chief Executive Officer at Zenkey. Alex, welcome. Thank you, Jordan, and uh, welcome everyone to today's webinar. Um, you know, uh, Jordan was kind enough to introduce me. I'm Alex Lager. I'm the CEO of, of Zenki. Uh, before Zenki, which I joined in June, I spent eight years with Verizon as Chief Product Officer for Cybersecurity. And prior to that, I spent a good amount of time with Deutsche Telekom uh, and Cisco. Uh, what is digital identity and, and why does it matter? Uh, why does it matter today uh, more than ever? Uh, is, is a topic about uh, of, of today's presentation. Now, in order to understand why there's such a hype uh, and why there's so much activity around authentication and digital identity, um, it really helps to you know, do a bit of a travel back in time uh, to the early days of the internet. And, and as we look how internet usage, infrastructure um, and, and security has changed, uh, this will lead us into why digital identity is so, uh, is so important and prominent today. So if we go to the left side, 1995, so if you look at online stats, whether it's OECD or IDC or Gartner, there's kind of this notion of the pre-internet area, which goes, you know, uh, 1945 actually with early computing capabilities to 1995, and then 1995 onwards is uh, considered the internet area, although Amazon was founded in 1994. But at that time, 95 to approximately 2006, IT was dominantly um, in support of humans, in support of a brick and mortar economy, uh, mortar economy uh, back office automation, business process automation. Um, but there was very little to no e-commerce. Um, you know, at 1990, in 1995, 0.6% of the world population used the internet. Uh, which was 16 million users. So 1995, 16 million users. Uh, as of March of this year, we had 65.5, uh, sorry, 5.5 billion users. Um, so you can see over the last 25 years, you know, this massive increase in, in internet usage. Um, that of course is not a single factor. It comes with tech, tech advances like, you know, computing power, storage efficiency, uh, broadband penetration is a, is a massive factor as you look at how the internet evolved. Um, but in 1995, it was basically uh, corporate owned data centers um, that ran, you know, cer certain server infrastructures, you know, enterprise resource planning, SAP, you know, uh, comes obviously was founded, um, you know, a bit earlier, but, but took off at that time. Um, and, you know, IT was all about making our legacy standard brick and mortar business um, more easy. Uh, security was entirely perimeter based, meaning uh, like the castle and moat analogy, um, companies drew a perimeter around their assets, around their data, data centers, their office IT infrastructure, and all the focus of security went into that perimeter. And the logic was secure the perimeter and trust everything that is within that perimeter. Um, so there was a lot of focus on firewall technology, intrusion detection, intrusion prevention. Um, but as, as, as long or as soon as you were behind the perimeter, you know, it was basically free for all. Um, there was very little focus on user identity, um, authentication, uh, or even asset knowledge. Meaning, a big challenge companies still face today as they as they transform from from perimeter based architectures to cloud and distributed architectures was that they didn't know which assets they have because of we just threw everything behind the perimeter um, and that was good enough. Um, the DMZ concept then came up, the demilitarized zone where internet facing assets were put in a specific area, uh, but it was still perimeter based. Now, 
starting with 2006, uh, we saw the rise of the cloud, which is nothing else as a data center operated uh, by, by a, you know, an entity that is basically out for hyperscaling uh, in usage of those resources. So it's compute, it's storage, and increasingly over the years, it was automating certain basic infrastructure services. Uh, we saw things like infrastructure as a service or platform as a service arise. Um, at the same time, we had uh, what I called here broadband explosion. Uh, so, you know, a far cry from the early days of uh, 288 or 36, six baud on uh, kilobit, sorry, uh, on modem technology. We saw ADSS, ADSL, SDSL, uh, the first fiber deployment. Um, which ultimately led to uh, more and more e-commerce starting to move into the digital space. Um, and that really is a significant shift um, that happened from early 2006, in the early days up to probably 2012, 13, when it, you know, when it really took off in sense of that companies started to create revenue natively in the digital domain. So IT was not only a cost center, that has been that, that was used to support legacy business models and operational models, but it actually became a profit center where companies started to create revenue natively in the digital space in the internet. Um, so IT became a core enabler for new business uh, and for business acceleration. Um, we also saw, you know, the inclusion of operation technology uh, OT. Um, and IoT, um, Internet of Things, um, basically take place. So a lot of environments that were completely shut off from the internet because they might not even have used the IP protocol were augmented and were transformed to support IP. And therefore they basically were opened up from a security perspective uh, to the internet uh, and, and therefore it, the attack surface uh, increased significantly. So in Europe, for example, um, you know, as late as 2015, 16, you saw transformation projects of large utility and energy providers, basically enabling their propriety IoT and OT environments uh, with, with IP capabilities. Now, what that did is it started to dissolve the perimeter, meaning this very comfortable notion of as long as I have my moat around my castle, everything inside is safe and I don't even need to know what exactly is in there uh, started to vanish because res resources now, A, were starting to fragment. Uh, you know, you had an increasing amount of cloud services. The average enterprise today has 1,500 different cloud services. Um, and you also saw users um, becoming more mobile with the, uh, with the advent of the iPhone uh, and true mobile computing. The challenge became that not all my enterprise assets are now within that perimeter, but they are cloud-based. Um, you know, software as a service has been used more and more, and my users start to be able to do more and more business critical and therefore IT critical tasks from remote places. And as I mentioned before, this is still a challenge many enterprises are having today that their asset databases are not uh, up to not up to date, meaning um, as it was not necessary to do that very diligent in a perimeter based model, this frag hyper fragmented model is really a, 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 as I said, a big challenge instead of, I need to understand where my assets are. I need to understand which data this, these assets store and process. Therefore the new paradigm became, became protect the asset and don't trust anyone. So from protecting the perimeter, with the hyperfragmentation, it became all about understanding which assets I have, where they are, what they store and process, and to protect these assets. Now, the reason I, I separated 19 from today is mostly because of two things, 5G and uh, COVID-19. So 5G is a hyper accelerant in sense of, uh, you know, broadband availability, speeds, round trip times, reliability and density. And what 5G is doing and will do is enable new use cases, uh, things that we simply couldn't do from a tech perspective in the past, whether it's mobile 3D printing, you know, uh, Ukraine two years, year and a half ago printed the first hospital uh, completely remotely um, in a large scale 3D printing exercise. Uh, did it, you know, mobile healthcare, um, you know, real time augmented gaming and so on and so forth. So as 5G um, accelerates and becomes the dominant uh, radioactive, radioactive, radio access network technology, 
we will see new use cases and capabilities, autonomous driving, smart cities arise that kind of hyper accelerate our dependency and our usage of digital, of digital assets. The other factor is COVID-19. So what that did is it, a, it accelerated the digital transformation agendas of almost every enterprise and, and government entities um, because users were not um, we couldn't rely anymore that users would be behind the perimeter. So a user coming physically to work, and therefore, you know, you can imagine stepping behind the perimeter, that was not a given anymore because users, we had this massive expo mass explosion of working from home uh, due to COVID-19. So, so companies had to accelerate the digital transformation agenda and journey and the fragmentation of assets that I mentioned in the middle section now was basically compounded by fragmentation of users. So not only are all my assets now fragmented, uh, but at the same time, all my users are. So in the past from users behind the perimeter, but, but assets moving away into the cloud, for example, we now are in a state where users are everywhere or anywhere, uh, and so are an enterprise, uh, enterprise assets. So with the backdrop of, of this you know, high level summary of how we moved from a, uh, from a uh, te technology advancement and, and usage of the internet, um, let's go to digital identity. So um, the reason why it is so critical and important today is relatively simple, right? The more transactions, uh, whether they are monetary or not, we move into the digital space, uh, the more critical transactions we perform in that space, the more important it is to have trust in the transacting parties. Um, you know, the user, for example, transacting with his or her bank. Um, identity simply answers who we are. It defines who we are, how we present ourselves to the world. Um, and it can become complex to define who we are online. And the reason again is relatively straightforward in a non-digital, in an analog world or in the past, um, the presentation of my identity, for example, would always be in most cases geographically limited, basically where I am physically as a human being, showing my passport at immigration, uh, showing my ID uh, at the bank. Um, and there was human interaction. So there was human to human interaction where one human looked at my ID, you know, look for watermark, uh, look if the picture matches the, the, the image that they had with the person uh, in front of them. Um, so that was relatively straightforward. Of course, there was fraud and there were forgeries, but the human to human interaction and the geographic limitation uh, basically were the boundaries uh, that we could control to a large extent from a fraud perspective. Now, with the internet in the digital space, this all, of course, is gone. There is no geographic limitation. My, I can use my identity or my identity can be used um, unauthorized anywhere in the world. Um, and, and equally, I am uh, vulnerable um, to identity theft, theft, to social engineering, or to any other attack vectors that, per, that, that, that um, uh, target my identity on a global basis, right? We just said before 5.5 billion users. So hypothetically, there's 5.5 billion users that uh, represent the attack surface against my personal individual identity. Now, defining digital identity. So the first thing is digital identifiers. Uh, this is often also referred to as PII, personally identifiable information, date of birth, driver's license, social security number, uh, email address, uh, or specific biometric features, uh, eye color, um, face shape, uh, and, and face features, uh, fingerprints, etc. Now, um, there is actually very little legislation and regulation in place when it comes to protecting PII. Uh, there is some that is industry specific, um, you know, like for example, HIPAA, HIPAA in the healthcare space. Um, and there's actually only three states in the US uh, that have dedicated consumer uh, identity private or consumer privacy laws, which is uh, Colorado, California, and Virginia. Uh, Europe, as you might know, has GDPR, implemented GDPR, um, the generic data protection regulation. Um, but overall, there is still, we are still lagging, um, you know, from a regulatory and, and, and legislative perspective, we're still actually lagging true protection for consumers 
and individuals. There's also digital behavior patterns, and we'll, we'll dive a bit deeper into that on the next slide. So next to the attributes that I have as associated with me as an individual, uh, there are uh, behavioral patterns, social media activity, uh, search and purchase history. Um, so while all this data is used by, you know, by is used in a targeted way for ads, uh, for example, it can and will also be used to help uh, determine your identity. Um, all of us have very specific usage patterns, the way we, uh, as it says here, operate in the social media space, but also usage behavior, how we operate the mouse, how we move the finger over the phone. Um, you know, with machine learning, it is very easy today to actually create very accurate patterns uh, that then can be used as a so-called factor. And, and we'll get to that uh, in a second. So when we talk about authentication or and or identity, uh, we talk about factors. Um, and uh, we listed the most common five factors here. Um, something that you know, uh, which is a password is a great example. Um, but you know, could be knowledge-based questions such as your first car, the name of your first pet, or, or your favorite TV show. Now, these things are tricky because they're obviously relatively easy to find out with social engineering. So, you know, with respective targeting on Instagram and Facebook and other and other means, it is relatively straightforward for a talented social engineer, uh, basically, to get these to get this information uh, about you or from you. The second is something you have. Now, something you have is one of the most secure factors, but it's also one of the most difficult factors because of the simple reason that it has low user acceptance. Meaning, um, if you ask me as your customer that I have to carry a separate physical device with me to transact with you digitally, uh, I will have an issue with that. I most likely will lose it, um, but it, and it will not be very convenient. Um, many of you for sure remember these gray RSA tokens that had this random number generator as a second factor. That's a, that is an example of a physical token, but you had to have this physically with you uh, in, order to, in order to operate it. Um, we'll show, I'll, I'll, I'll talk a little bit later about how Zenki in particular, and as an example, has converted the smartphone uh, to be a physical token. Um, something that you are, what you are, your fingerprint, uh, your retina scan, um, facial recognition, and liveness check. Liveness check means that when you onboard your digital identity uh, into the digital space, to have assurance in A, that it is you, but B, that you actually, you know, in person, in flesh and blood, doing this at the same, uh, at this very moment. So is the onboarding of the digital identity actually done live by you as a human being uh, and not spoofed or, or done by, uh, by any other process? Uh, where you are is another factor, IP address, MAC, ad MAC address, and geolocation. Now, um, that is, you know, that is a hairy topic from a user privacy perspective. Uh, I'm sure you, some of you have followed, there was a lot of debate years ago about, uh, for example, the carriers um, and, and what the carers can do and should do. And the carers, you know, um, basically uh, prohibit and prevent today of sharing of any user specific location data. Um, but there are some things we can do with location uh, under the umbrella of zero knowledge based uh, proofing. And I explain what that is. Uh, and this becomes a very powerful feature because if we can determine at least on the macro level, your, you know, your location, even whether you are in the United States or not, that alone uh, you know, helps us to reduce the attack vector uh, from an authentication and entity proofing perspective significantly. And then the last one is, I mentioned before, the behavior, something that you do. Um, this could be explicitly uh, required from the user, like a gesture, a picture password, but it can also be based on your behavior. Uh, so as I said before, uh, machine learning um, capabilities today are pretty sophisticated in sense of creating a unique profile of your usage. Um, so, uh, you know, a little app running on, on, on my phone would take probably one to two days based on how I hold the phone, how I type, how I swipe, et cetera, uh, to create a so-called baseline. Uh, and then it can check my behavior against that baseline. Uh, and if it, 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 it uh, differs too far from that baseline, 
you can uh, basically um, deny the authentication or the ID proofing event accordingly. So think of digital identity as a key. Um, and the longer the key, the more teeth the key has, if you like, the more secure it becomes. So what we are doing in authentication and ID proofing is we are basically increasing the entry barrier to an attacker by combining more and more of these factors. Now, what we always say in cybersecurity, there is no 100% proof or guarantee against the breach. Um, but there is the possibility to raise the bar so high um, that, the, that the attack surface or individuals that would have those capabilities and skills to still breach an environment becomes very, very small. Again, think of the real world, right? Think of your favorite heist movie and think of an environment that is poorly protected where you don't even have to be an experienced burglar to open a window and get into the house versus Think of your favorite heist movie, a highly secured um, environment where the majority, 99.9% .9 of, of people will never have access to or get access to. But of course, there's always, um, you know, in, in case of the movies, there's always our hero who, who ultimately manages it. The point being is what we ultimately do with factors and by combining factors is we maximize the entry barrier um, into, uh, into, you know, an attacker being able to you know, basically uh, incorporate us, our identity uh, in the digital space. Um, now, another principle that is very common in cybersecurity is how secure is enough? Uh, and, and this pertains to, you know, identity, but it also pertains to access control, network security. So every aspect of cybersecurity is always the question, how do we measure whether we are doing enough? And, and the simplest way to answer this is your security posture should be proportional to the worst possible outcome a breach would or could cause. What this means is if, if I just want to get access to, um, you know, to an online resource that has no real impact in case of uh, breach, right? So whether or not my account at XYZ is breached or not has no real impact on me. Uh, it doesn't reveal any PII. It doesn't allow commercial transaction or monetary transaction. Um, it does, then it's relatively low criticality. You don't need the best, the best and the strongest cybersecurity posture for that. You might be fine with a single factor. You might be fine with your browser remembering the password and there's not even a second factor. But as we have seen before now with so much um, transactions and, and daily, daily processes moving into the digital space, um, there's more and more use cases that actually do require um, maximized security posture uh, for digital identity, for example. So whether it's address changes, whether it's government benefits, whether it's monetary transaction, whether it's cryptocurrency transaction, um, and so on and so forth, there is more and more use cases uh, being enabled in the digital space where we really want to maximize uh, the security of identity and authentication. Uh, so Gartner, one of the one of the big analyst firms, predicts that today uh, around 25% of entities, and when I say entities, that's private sector and public sector, have a need for strong digital identity and authentication. That number goes up by forecast by Gartner uh, to 85% by end of 2023. So the expect the analyst expectation is dependency on strong authentication and digital identity is moving from 25% this year to 85% uh, end of 2023. And the major three drivers from an industry perspective shouldn't be a surprise. Number one, government. Uh, number two, financial institutions. And number three is healthcare. Um, healthcare in particular is probably the industry that has seen the least digital disruption uh, over the last years. So I think there's a lot of catching up uh, that needs to be done. Uh, and with the government, of course, um, we do quite a bit of work with the US government. And the reason why there is such a massive growth is, is twofold. Number one, there's a heightened and renewed uh, focus on cybersecurity, right? President Biden issued an executive order on that on May 12th. And B, it's COVID-19. People feel less comfortable and less safe going physically to an office, whether it's social security um, or any other uh, institution. They demand, I would say, almost say, to do more and more of these tasks online. 
and therefore this heightened and massive increased need for strong uh, authentication and identity. Now, why does it matter? And we mentioned many factors here already. Um, cybersecurity threats are on the rise. Uh, cyber, or cyber, um, cyber espionage uh, or cyber crime in general is a multi, multi billion dollar industry. Um, if it would be a country, I think it would be in the top 30 from a GDP, uh, GDP perspective. Um, and again, it's relatively straightforward. The more economic value we push into the digital space, the more attractive it becomes, uh, it becomes for, for, for adversaries. So in other words, it is not today, if you are a criminal, if, you, if you're an individual with criminal energy, it doesn't make sense to rob a bank. Uh, you would be much more successful potentially but also have much more opportunity uh, in the digital space. So as you know, as we move more and more value uh, into the digital space, obviously proportionally we attract we attract uh, more and more uh, adversaries. Um, and again, seventy five percent of all attacks are financially motivated. So nothing has changed there. Uh, if you're looking for a good resource, uh, Verizon has the uh, data breach investigations report. You might be familiar with that. It's published since thirteen years now. Um, it's free. So you just Google data breach investigations report. Uh, it's a free download. And that gives you all the stats around which kind of attacks, which motives, um, as I said, 75% financially, um, basically are persistent in every single year. Um, and I think I wrote down one here is 85% of breaches last year had a human element involved, meaning it was either a human doing a misconfiguration or basically human credentials, username, password, uh, or any of the other PII factors we have mentioned before, where knowledge of the same enables an adversary respective access um, to resources. 61% involved stolen credentials. So 61% of all recorded breaches globally last year involved stolen credentials, username, password, uh, or, or any other um, codes for that matter. Now, I think I'm stating the obvious here that the damage to enterprises or financial institutions in particular is loss of consumer trust um, and, uh, and for the and, and, and monetary damage to some degree. And of course, for the, for the financial institutions, it's, uh, you know, it is quite a big effort to remain compliant, um, you know, retain and grow ideally consumer trust. Retain, retain customers, re, you know, retain a positive public image, uh, prevent fraud, um, you know, and, and uh, insurance costs are involved here. Um, so there's a, there's a significant uh, financial impact for enterprises in general and, and banks in particular. The, the interesting challenge in the financial sector is the balance between um, fraud prevention and user experience. Um, it is, it exists in other industries too. I have not seen it as strong anywhere as in the financial industry, which means that in order to remain competitive, uh, it's all about the user experience today. So it's not so much about, you know, a user walking into a local branch, although there's also a certain comeback happening there and the experience of, you know, interacting with human beings and in that brick and mortar space, but how easy is it to use the app? How stable is the app? How fast can I get done what I want to get done? Whether it's you know opening an account, wiring money, etc. So the the big challenge in cybersecurity in general. So this pertains to the enterprise space as well as to the consumer space. Is uh, cybersecurity will only be as strong as it is acceptable by the end user. Meaning we have far more powerful cybersecurity capabilities today in many areas that we are actually using. And the reason is if the users don't accept it, it's, based, it's theory, uh, but we can't implement it in practice. So that balance between how much can I push security utility, how, how secure can I become, while at the same time retain the, the, the acceptance by my consumers, that's one of the major challenges in cybersecurity. Not so much in the enterprise space, because to some degree enterprises, it's easier for them to, to prescribe I wouldn't say dictate, but to prescribe to the users what they have to use in their work environment. But in the consumer space, it, it definitely is, is a big challenge. Um, and, and this is where many companies differentiate today based on the user experience. 
So we have a couple of polls uh, during today's session. And we're gonna kick it off with the first poll. Do you feel your organization is prepared to handle cyber threats? Now, that's a very generic question and I don't expect everyone to understand in detail their security posture, um, but I'm sure there is anecdotal knowledge. I'm sure there is a personal experience that you have. Um, so, you know, it's just a question to get us warmed up how you personally feel about the organization's posture. It's anonymous, so no worries. So let's get that kicked off, Jordan, if you don't mind, and then we'll we'll take it from there. Sorry, it does not let us click. Okay, so we have uh, the answers coming in. Uh, yes, we feel prepared, zero. Yes, we feel mostly prepared, but there is room for improvement, 60%. Uh, no, we don't feel prepared. Twenty, and I'm not sure. Twenty percent. Um, it's a, it's a, it's a, you know, reasonable distribution, um, and and no surprises there. Um, the room for improvement is always a big challenge in cybersecurity because there's so many vectors and there's so many things one can do. Um, I think that's probably a completely separate talk. Uh, how enterprises deal with prioritization of posture improvement. Today, obviously, we talk about the the attack vector, you know, user credentialing, digital identity, and access. Okay, we have a couple more uh, more specific questions later on. Um, types of cyber crimes. So, how do they happen? Um, there is uh, there is a dictionary nowadays on classifying cyber crime in all the attack vectors, attack varieties. The data breach investigations report is a good, is a good uh, source if you wanna learn more about that. We just picked a couple of here that are representative uh, in particular in the digital identity space. Weak passwords is, is, is a classic uh, and you might have seen um, newspaper articles about how do we get rid of the password and, you know, and, and, and which technologies are available today to be in a password, passwordless world. Um, and we'll, we'll talk a bit about this later. Uh, phishing scams. Um, so, you know, scams that are targeted at basically getting information out of a user um, or making a user do a specific transaction, uh, for example, in corporate environments, right? My CFO told me you should immediately wire $10,000 here. I know this sounds silly, but it is still happening. So don't, you know, there are still a lot of companies that don't have very many controls in place. I'm sure this is not this, you know, convinced this is not the case in, in, in finance, but it is still it is still a very uh, valid attack vector. Phishing scams also have in common that often there is payload delivery. So with the phishing scam itself, you will often see ransomware being delivered on top. So it's not only phishing for credentials or for information, often that in that same in that same process. Uh, adversaries uh, basically drop malware. Social engineering mentioned before, uh, you know, I'll get uh, very friendly with you on Facebook over weeks. And, you know, there is campaigns running that run over a year. You would be surprised uh, how patient and long-term some of these hacking campaigns are planned. And via the social engineering efforts, I ultimately um, will get to many of the answers, knowledge-based answers that you would give uh, in, in case of a security challenge, name of your pet and, and so on and so forth. Uh, app spoofing or hacking, that's a more direct approach or more direct uh, attack in sense of uh, the app pretending to be your bank app or the web page pretending to be your web page, um, or you get an email that is perfectly branded uh, from your bank in sense of looking as, as coming from your bank, uh, that itself would be an entryway into, into hacking, for example. And then of course, network level breaches. Um, I did not explain, I just realized what zero trust is because the first slide uh, was called from perimeter to zero trust. Uh, and it's relatively straightforward. Zero trust means that no component or asset is allowed to interact with any other asset without prior successful authentication uh, and authorization, meaning I need to authenticate and it needs to be determined what I am allowed to do post authorization. Um, that is the exact opposite of, of the perimeter model, right? Where everything behind the perimeter is, is allowed to operate. Zero trust simply means what 
whatever component or human being that is interacts with another assets needs to be authenticated and needs to be verified uh, in sense of uh, authorization. That is a big topic in network level security these days. Zero trust network access, ZTNA, um, is all about establishing this trust uh, prior to every transaction. Now the impact we talked about this already, you know, loss of loss of trust, uh, personal data compromised, um, and there is increasing financial uh, dis uh, disincentives. Meaning, um, you know, the GDPR, for example, has a fixed percentage of your annual revenue uh, that is basically being uh, used as a penalty in case you are found uh, guilty of, uh, you know, negligently disclosing, for example, personal information. Now. Uh, Next poll question, do you know what the global costs of financial crime uh, compliance was for your industry in 2020? So the total cost for the financial industry pertaining to, uh, to, to uh, financial crime, um, which is direct, direct, uh, direct loss of funds by consumers. It is penalties that financial institutions have to pay, money they need to spend on post breach initiatives and so on and so forth. Okay, we have a 50, 50, 60, 40. Do we have, ah? Uh, we have 37% of answers coming in. Okay, I think uh, we have all the answers in. The answer is correct. 213.9 billion uh, is is the correct answer. Um, that's a, that's that that's you know that's significant for the opportunity cost. So if we look at uh, cybersecurity budgets in proportion to potential or actual damage, uh, finance and healthcare obviously uh, are making significant investments there, but there's still many industries where that equation is actually quite lopsided in sense of the investments, you know, being significantly less than proportionally the potential damage uh, enterprises or companies would face. I just go to the next slide here. Now, identity market for my financial institutions. So there is an unprecedented amount of money flowing into, uh, into this space. Um, there is a couple of, of, of um, you know, sub-industries, uh, but the most common industries are um, um, CIM, Customer or Consumer Identity Access Management, um, Passwordless Authentication, Multi-Factor Authentication, um, and uh, Identity Verification. So these are the major four uh, IT or cybersecurity industries uh, where we see a lot of, of VC and P uh, money flowing into. Uh, and you can see here from the snippets we have provided, uh, this is a very important topic. You know, know your customer require is a, is a formal requirement for banks and financial institutions. Um, there is one big challenge here that we will, uh, that we expect and that's market consolidation. So what I mean with that is, there is billions and billions of dollars going into that market at the moment. Um, and there is, uh, you know, I stopped counting the startups in the authentication and digital identity space. Uh, it's literally a, an explosion. Go onto, onto Crunchbase and just look for authentication and digital identity. It, it, it is insane uh, in sense of uh, the money, of venture capital or private equity or other money going into that space. Here's a problem. The consumer is increasingly becoming the owner of his or her identity. What this means is in the past, if you remember the first slide where we have walked through the history, in the past, there was no such thing as identity. There was credentials. So a user basically had to have username password for every asset that he or she was operating with. So whether it's in the corporate space or the internet space, you had to manage 30, 40, 50 username and passwords because identity, although it was not called that way, was decentralized. It was determined, managed and policed by every individual entity. What is happening now is that is changing. And as we're talking about true identity, meaning a true trustworthy representation of your carbon-based identity in the digital space, that can only be owned by yourself. So as the ownership is moving back to the consumer, meaning you know, there's only my, I only exist once and my identity should be owned by me, 
there's only so much space for solutions in that space. Meaning um, there is a expectation that by end of 22, beginning of 23, we'll see that bubble consolidate. Uh, and the reason is simple. No consumer will accept 15 different apps on their phone for authentication or ID proofing, right? So users will ultimately gravitate uh, towards a number less than a handful of providers or solutions um, that they can use to authenticate and prove their identity in the digital space. And that will obviously drive consolidation so that by end of 23, uh, we expect to, there to be three to four dominant players in the market uh, for authentication and digital identity um, and the rest, you know, the rest being, uh, being consolidated. So the consumer becoming the, you know, re re retaining or not retaining, um, re-owning their own identity basically will drive market consolidation uh, within the next couple of years, simply because of consumer acceptance. So this is no different around the world. Uh, so if you look at the individual uh, growth rates here um, from North America, 33% growth, uh, you know, APEC, LATAM. So uh, no big surprises here. Um, the only difference is that in some developing countries, uh, so second world and third world, you often see uh, less growth rates because countries often leapfrog. So developing countries in tech, not limited to digital identity, as they are behind, they often skip two steps. And as they catch up, they leapfrog to the latest state of tech uh, or infrastructure. Um, and therefore, growth rates look a bit different uh, in, in developing second and third world countries often. Another, another poll. You feel confident in the technology your organization is currently using? Um, again, this is probably more anecdotal, but let's give it a, let's give it a shot and see what the sentiment is. No, I have concerns, okay. Okay, I think we have uh, we have a 60-40 split between uh, having concerns and, and being confident that the measures are uh, in place. Um, there's still a lot of work to be done. Let's put it like this. Uh, if, if we look at the state we are in and what we, you know, what the what 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 the industry and the market can provide, there's still a significant amount of fraud. Um, again, there is no world without fraud. The question is how high can we set the bar? proportional to an acceptable user experience, right? And that's this, that's the question we ask ourselves, but it's the same question the banks ask them, themselves, you know, at least from my experience, from the banks I've spoken to is, as I mentioned before, that balance between how much can I minimize fraud with tech without uh, impacting the user experience and therefore loyalty, uh, retention, customer retention, et cetera. Okay, moving on. Oh, we have another one. Oh. What technology is your company using to ensure your customers are who they say they are? Right? The know your customer uh, requirement, multi-factor, biometric, propriety, or not known, unknown. Okay. 40 multi-factor, 20 biometric, uh, 20 propriety, and 20, I don't know. So multi-factor is relatively straightforward, right? The most common one you probably know is the SMS, uh, the you know, text message. Um, but multi-factor simply means that an additional factor is required. So if you remember the slides with the factors, um, you might have a transaction that is satisfactory with two factors, but then the user does something and we call it step up authentication. Then we want to add a factor in order to secure the respective transaction. So I could, for example, log into a website um, only with you know, my username and password. Uh, that would be the factor something I know. Um, but then I want to change my address or I want to you know, do a monetary transaction, let's say. Now that would basically trigger a so-called step out authentication and ask for an additional factor. Um, and you know, 
you can pick from that list of factors we have listed before. The most common one is, is, uh, is messaging, uh, SMS-based, which itself has its own challenges. Uh, three years ago, the SS7 protocol, which is the dominant protocol for telephone signaling, including messaging, was, was breached. There was a vulnerability found. Uh, so hackers were able to redirect SMS messages uh, or read SMS messages. And nowadays, the SIM swap attack, uh, you know, a, a, a fraudulent actor convincing uh, the phone company or the service company providing services to the phone company that their phone was broken or stolen into in, in order to issue them a new SIM card. Um, so that SIM swap uh, is, is a challenge in context of using text message sms as a second factor um i personally believe or we personally believe that the days of, of message based second factor are counted um you'll see you'll see quite some innovation uh, in that space over the next month and years um, as we move forward okay um we added a, a couple of slides uh, about zenki itself um just to give you a practical view of how some of those concepts I talked about, how they manifest in a real life product. Um, so, so Zenki is the, is the, is the joint venture of, of uh, AT&T, T-Mobile and Verizon. And what we are basically doing is we're using the infrastructure of the carriers to provide secure authentication identity proofing. Um, so what we do are all the things we have been talking about so far, strong authentication, ID proofing, um, on-demand third-party validation of a uploaded ID and fraud detection. Now, there is, as I said before, a lot of providers in this space. Um, so there's a lot of great innovation happening. Um, what we particularly do is, if you remember that slide with the factors, uh, something you have, and the challenge that users won't accept a separate device or token, um, what the carriers did with Zenki is, is basically convert the mobile phone into a true security token. So users who uh, activate, you know, register on Zenki, um, what the phone or the app will do better is it creates an immutable and cryptographic binding of the user, his or her physical phone, his or her SIM card and telephone number. Um, so that, that, that relationship is basically, you know, immutably bound. And every time the user does a transaction with Zenki, uh, the SIM card authenticates against the network and says, you know, is this account still active? Is the SIM not been swapped, et cetera. But it also verifies that it is, that this relationship is intact. It has to be that particular user with that phone, SIM card, and phone number. Um, and therefore we have, you know, we have, the capabilities we have here uniquely is that we can convert the phone to a security token. You know, every user has a phone. We have 96% um, uh, mobile phone usage of which 91% are smartphones. Uh, so that's, that's our best bet in sense of how do we create a security token that literally almost everyone uh, basically carries around with them. Um, and the, the additional thing we do, uh, as it mentions, online fraud detection here, is uh, that we pick up signals from the carrier backbones. So there are certain signals that are indicative of fraud, call forwarding, SIM swapping, uh, but we also pick up zero knowledge based proof points. And I mentioned before that I'll explain what zero knowledge based proofing is. So zero knowledge based proofing is, is proofing a certain fact without, with zero knowledge of the details. Sounds very complicated, it's very simple. Rather than, uh, Rather than, um, for example, the carriers giving us the precise location of an individual, which they cannot do, will not do, um, they give us zero knowledge. They tell us the user is within 50 miles of his or her home address. So um, it doesn't tell me any details about the exact location, but I know that you know the user, for example, is within the specific radius uh, of his or her home address. And that's a strong indicator uh, obviously, as I mentioned before, when it comes to fraud determination. Another example would be um, the phone is longer than the SIM card or the contract is longer than 24 hours uh, active, right? So 
um, a lot of, of fraud cases, you know, users will just buy a SIM card, use it, and then trash it. Uh, so that's another example. Another example is user is older than 18 years of age. So with this zero, zero knowledge based proofing, we can um, make sure that we protect the privacy of consumers, but at the same time, we can provide some information that is strongly indicative uh, towards, uh, towards fraud. Uh, and then the most, as you probably know, the most common way this is done today is by scoring. So a lot of factors are collected, correlated, and the risk score is created. And then companies set their security policy basically based on a score threshold upon which they will allow or deny a certain transaction to proceed. And then the last piece I added here because we did talk about it is zero trust network access. So the problem with zero trust network access on the consumer side is it is a separate step. So normally uh, in the enterprise space, um, initiating a ZTNA transaction uh, or connection in most cases involves a tunnel. So an, an encrypted tunnel where payload, meaning data that is transmitted from A to B is sent through the tunnel, meaning it's highly encrypted and then decrypted on the other side. Now, if you look at the consumer behavior uh, or consumer, you know, we call it cognitive effort, meaning how, effort, how much effort do we have to invest to basically get something done, then this is a very different game when you talk about the work, workforce versus consumer. So the consumer starting an app, and initiating a tunnel and then authenticating uh, will not work. Um, and therefore the approach we have taken is we are building at the moment uh, a zero trust network adapter into the app, into the Zenki app. So what that enables is if a user successfully authenticates with his or her bank, the app will silently establish an IPsec tunnel so the encrypted tunnel to that bank and now all the data that goes from the banking app on the phone goes through that tunnel to the bank is highly encrypted. And the moment the user closes the bank app, the tunnel is torn down. Uh, the big difference here is it's, it's, it's transparent, it's invisible to the user. There is no separate steps required. The authentication with Zenki itself basically triggers that tunnel and then closing the app basically tears the tunnel down. And that brings us to the end of my presentation. Um, we have eight minutes left. I hope there was some uh, some new, some useful information for you in that presentation. And I'm gonna ask Jordan if we have questions in the chat section. Let me just open that. We, we do not, uh, but just okay. a reminder to the attendees, please, if you have a question, type it into the Q&A and I will read it for you. Okay, let's give it a couple of minutes to see if any questions pop up. Okay, I think there are no questions. You have my email address on the slide. So if there is indeed a question that comes to mind later, please feel free to drop me an email. And with that, uh, thank you very much for joining today. Thank you for your attention and, uh, and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. And with that, we must conclude today's program. The session has been recorded and will be available within three to five business days. On behalf of the Consumer Bankers Association, thank you to our speakers and of course, all of today's participants. Have a great afternoon and you may now disconnect.